Continuing on from the previous instalments, thank you for checking out my video of Paleo Rewind. Paleo Rewind, as you may or may not be familiar with, is an annual series created by the Expeditioners Discovery Guild, which sets out to document some of the most notable, important and or interesting discoveries throughout the year, involving the collaboration of a great number of content creators who also primarily produce videos on paleontology. This year is a little different from previous years, as this time around, each month is split in half in terms of content covered, with each creator covering one half of each month. As an example, my video will be covering the first half of March, while the seconds will be covered by Omega Freelancer, whose video you'll be able to watch after this one. After every creator has uploaded their video, a compilation video will be uploaded on the Edge channel, and while it's sure to be a lengthy one, it will most definitely be worth it. As is well known, the radiation of archosaurmorph reptiles in the Triassic period produced an unprecedented collection of diverse forms with a mix of varied body sizes and ecologies. Some were unique to the Triassic, although some body plans would later be converged upon by later members of their groups. One of the most striking examples of this was with the genus Trioptychus, which possessed a dome head that would be later seen in the Pachycephalosaurus dinosaurs. Said cranial anatomy has now also been recognised with a second described genus from our upper Triassic deposits in present-day India. This new taxon was named Cranosaura cutii, which was likely to be the sister taxa of Trioptychus based on the presence of a greatly expanded skull roof with a deep dorsal opening through the dome, as well as other defining features. Said domes were only about 9cm long, so the animals themselves weren't all that big. The etymology of the genus name comes from the Greek words Kranos, meaning helmet, and Sora, lizard or reptile with a specific name honouring T.S. Cussey, who discovered the material back in the 90s. For now at least, little was known of Cranosaura, as they were only represented by the thick, near-solid dome. And with only two specimens being known of, there is still a lot of guesswork involved, but they were nonetheless very fascinating animals. The study of audition in fossil hominins is of great interest to anthropologists, given its relationship with intraspecific vocal communication and the potential results which can be gleaned from it. Comparatively less is known about the hearing abilities of Neanderthals when compared to Homo sapiens, and this means that for the longest time, little of their capabilities were understood. A study that relies on computerised tomography scans and a comprehensive model from the field of auditory managed to establish a sound power transmission through the ulna and middle ear, and then calculates the occupied bandwidth in the Andertals. The occupied bandwidth, for those who don't know, relates to the efficiency of the vocal communication system of a species, with a larger bandwidth allowing for a large number of easily distinguishable acoustic signals to be used in vocalisation, boosting its efficiency. The results of the study found that the auditory capacities in Neanderthals did not differ too much from those in modern humans. Notably, the occupied bandwidth in Neanderthals extended towards frequencies that primarily involved consonant production, suggesting that this may have been an important component of their vocal communication, making them very similar to us and our capabilities. While much is still to be understood, the results of this paper, coupled with recent discoveries indicating symbolic behaviours, reinforces the idea that the Andertals possessed a type of human language, and one that was just as complex and efficient as us. As seen on the channel before, the fauna of dinosaurs and other vertebrates that inhabited late Cretaceous Europe were quite peculiar. Europe during the Cretaceous consisted of an archipelago, with many of the animals found in the region during this time being affected by their insular habitats that resulted in a great range of strange body plans and sizes. While fragmentary, a newly described theropod, specifically a Truodontid from Spain, represents the first reported from Europe, dating within 200,000 years of the mass extinction which would eventually wipe them out. Named Tomorrow Inspiratus, while only being known from a second metatarsal, studies of the interior of the bone have shown that it was a sub-adult, and that it was uniquely fast-growing. According to the bone histology, these animals had a growth pattern in which it grew rapidly in early ontogeny and then attained its sub-adult size quickly. This growth rate was much quicker when compared to other non-avian theropods, but similar to extant paleognathid birds indicating their close relation to them and giving paleontologists an interesting look into the history of a newly described animal. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of Paleo Rewinds, and hopefully you learned something new about the discoveries and or descriptions made for the month of March, at least the first half of it. 
To watch the next instalments, be sure to visit Omega Freelancer, where they will be covering the second half of March, as well as Edge, where a final compilation video of all of our parts will be uploaded to come the new year. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that's maybe.